All right, we are live. Yes, we are. We are live. So hello, everyone. I want to say welcome to Live with the Empowerment Advocate. I am Dr. Yolanda Jerry, and today we have a very special guest who is a native of New Orleans, Mr. Leroy Crawford. And so just to give you a little information about him, I will read his bio so you can get a little background about what he does. Mr. Leroy Crawford is a 24 year professional whose passionate approach to juvenile justice advocacy continues to command national attention. He is known as a caring and committed advocate for helping young people out of the darkness of hopelessness and strife giving them the tools to envision and navigate their way to brighter futures for themselves. As a New Orleans native, he rose through juvenile justice ranks from the trenches. He continues to share his successful training methods. He has earned the respect of his colleagues and he is recognized as one of the best juvenile justice workshops. He is one of the most sought after motivational speakers specializing in navigating street culture inside out through cultural competency and working with violent at-risk youth offenders. He is also the founder slash owner of Inside Out Behavior Consulting Services. Mr. Crawford has become instrumental in helping to not only develop the training curriculum, but to implement practices and programs that have shown a significant decrease in youth violence. His premier latest program, Navigating Street Culture Inside Out, was piloted at the New Orleans Juvenile Detention Center and also featured in the Fusion TV documentary, Prison Kids, Juvenile Justice in America. He has also been recognized and presented at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, National School Safety Conference, Justice Association, Adolescence Conference, Louisiana Annual Governor's Conference and several community-based programs serving at-risk youth, at, at youth. Understanding the new breed of gangs and violence in a powerful illustration of New Orleans gritty street culture, Mr. Crawford shares his unique perspective via his speaking engagement where he breaks down navigating street culture inside out and trapped in street code loyalty deception. So there you have it. I have given you the bio and background of Mr. Leroy Crawford. I want to say thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm truly honored to have you as a guest and very honored because you are from my home city, New Orleans. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was a lot of things you read. <laughs> I, <feel laughs> I know. Like, you, know you, you, you forget you being done all those things. Right until you actually, you know, hear it for yourself, right? Yeah, you want to make your you want to make your city proud, make your family proud. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So, if you are watching us, because I see some of you are, are watching us right now, if you could please share this broadcast, tell a family member, tell a friend, tag them in this live, share it with them later. Maybe they'll watch the replay. But our goal is to get this information that Mr. Crawford has for us tonight to be able to educate and bring an awareness to the people who have children in the streets and hopefully be able to save our kids. So with that being said, I'll start with my first question. And I got some people jumping on, so I'm gonna go ahead and show that they're sitting here saying hello to you. Hello, okay. saying hello to everybody. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. So with that being said, First question, my first question for you, Mr. Crawford, is can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, more on a personal level, and also what inspired you to do the work that you are doing today? Okay, so personally, I grew up in New Orleans, 1515 Milton Street, apartment F, the St. Bernard Project. It wasn't a housing development, it was the St. Bernard Project. I and to have the everyday exposure to what a real family looked like the village, children working together, parents, and have all those things taking place, Dr. Jerry, at the same time of poverty and things of that nature, it really propelled me to want to have this career. Now, I'm going to tell the truth. I have a friend named Blaine Henry, Ruben Henry, and his mother was Ms. Odell Henry and he had a brother named Kareem Singleton. At the age of 23, 
I started working with kids. All of us had a group home called Shape. It was in Carrollton, right there in the in Gertown. Frank Nitty, uh, the DJ Frank Nitty, Lloyd Limas. I mean, so many of us, we really work in a group home. And we wow. learn to care for people right on the spot, on the job training. That was important. But the, the backbone of all of this, it's not just my dad, it's my high school. I'm, I'm a St. Augustine graduate. Uh oh, purple and lights in the house. In the building, <laughs> in the house. And with that being said, I just realized that an old boys school, despite whether we had enough money as our classmates, whether we thought the same, you realize the importance of brotherhood. And that was a foundation that never left me that when you have a friend and it becomes lawyer, it's a brotherhood. And those right. brotherhoods carry for years. I have some people that I would immediately shout out would be like my, 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 my boy, Kyle Thompson. You know, he's in Houston. His family was our family. Uh, I mean, this is real family, Morrell Merricks. Uh, these are everyday friends from the very beginning. I can remember Kyle and myself and Shirley White, we was working at the group home by ourselves on Jackson, sitting on the porch, College Temple. He's a mentor who gave us opportunity. So when you look at people like that, Dr. Jerry, you realize that you're just in it. You have to figure it out on the go. But as long as you know that kids love you and care for you, you, get, you begin to realize it's different. Like now I have some friends, uh, Will Harden, good friend of mine, Dr. Nurse. I mean, I got some friends I talk to, and they said it straight all the time. My friends care. You need to have balance, and with that balance, it brings me to today. I love what I do. I travel a lot. I've been featured on the programs. I, I had the fortunate opportunity to work at the Youth Study Center. I was the assistant superintendent. If it was a kid that did any type of crime, from truancy all the way to murder, I knew every single kid in that jail and their family. Wow. And broke bread with them, but I also prayed with them, did Bible study. No, I'm not a pastor or a preacher, so I might have chopped up a few, ver a few <laughs> verses, but we did Bible study. Then I had the fortunate opportunity to also work at Bridge City Center for Youth. So having the school side of it in the beginning and corrections, that's what brings me to the part about trapped in the streets, buried alive, saving our kids. You know, like, it's so many misconceptions, man. and that's what brings me here today. My, I got proud parents. My dad passed. My brother Wayne Crawford, I got my kids. Uh, this family must, you know, my ex-wife Roxanne, you know, I, I don't want to leave nobody out because everybody played a role into who I am today. And it's just so I'm gonna be calling them out as we talking. So let's let's go. <laughs> let's get it. I hear you. Well, you've had a lot of people that played an important role in your life since childhood, all the way up through the successes to where you are today. Um, to be able to, and then they see they see the vision that you had and is willing to actually, you know, help you out in all of the endeavors and the things that you wanted to do to be able to, you know, be out there. Like you said, it takes a village, you know, back then, that's the word, that was the word on the street, it takes a village to raise children. Yes. So uh, thank you so much for what you do um, and continue to do that. So I, my next question is how has being a part of the juvenile justice system affected you personally and or professionally? Mm. Let's start with personally. I saw, I saw it firsthand. I had a firsthand on the scenes look at disproportionate of minority contact, meaning that I had a firsthand in the door, nobody can tell me, where I've seen kids that were white kids and black kids treated totally differently. Not because of that, it was a part of the facility and it was the policy, it just never came. I, I mean, I could count from the amount of years I was there. If I saw 50 white kids mm -hmm. actually detained, if 50, over wow. five plus years, and it just made you realize that personally it hurt because we had to tell our kids what they could be, tell our kids it's okay, tell our kids forgive. We were teaching and preaching, coping when it just wasn't fair. So personally, mm -hmm. I, I, I understood that. Also, I learned the political side of things, meaning that sometimes you just have to be quiet. I learned that sometimes you couldn't voice your opinion. And I felt right. that was very, that was just harmful. I mean, it was like, the term is called tone policing. It was so mm. many times people would tell you, you can't say this, don't speak up, you do this, you're gonna lose your job, and it's happened. So when you have a rumor mill stronger than the policies and procedures, you think about that. Like the guy, Merrill Merricks, we, he's with the police department, he will come over to the wow. youth study center and volunteer and work with kids. They never knew he was a police and when he would put his uniform on at the end and come inside. It just showed you that you had to teach hate. 
you had to teach what it was like to not work together. And that's the personal side. Now let's talk business, right? Some some kids, I realized that they had plea bargains. And how could you sign a plea bargain when you're a kid with a 504 accommodation or really struggle understanding the basic information? You had kids who were receiving sentences for armed robbery, which they should have been held accountable. But you're getting 30 and 40 years. You had programs that were issued by the court to help people go to the homes with angle monitors and things. And you find these kids weren't being serviced. So that's not any representation, but of a company that was considered to be a vendor. You had so many youth programs that were paid and funded to provide a service for those kids. And you'll find out once they was incarcerated through conversation that they all, they all had programs. They all were in programs, you know what I'm saying? But if he was in a program and he's heading out for armed robbery, what happened to when fans gave the kid some program to be with Dr. Jerry and the people never went to his house? What happens to those young ladies that fans actually put them in a program in the community? So you always hear people say, we need more community-based programs. No, we don't need more. We need the ones that's going to do the work. That's right. Because those kids were in community-based programs. And it was all about the course of being in those programs. But unfortunately, you have people falsifying documents. Let's just be honest. The court don't really realize it. They just turning things in. So you wow. ask the kid, when was the last time you saw your uh, your worker that come to the house? Now remember, this is not a state worker. This is one of those community based programs. They're like, they don't come over here. Oh, they just, I just I just signed the paper, and once I sign the paper, they go. So you look at wow. the business side of it. How many kids are victims of, of you know, honestly, how many kids have been victims of a lack of oversight? How many kids have been victims of? Just foolishness. I, I see my brother Sam Bowles with the young Marines. When you find young people who really love and help you, Terry Clay said years ago, before he was Terry Clay, the LCSW, we used to do this work. Mm-hmm. And you got to think about from 93 to now, Dr. Jerry, there's no way you can tell me that we're servicing our kids properly because it's too much that we know. It's, and, and I hate when people say this well, is this the black kids? Unfortunately, it is just the black kids being targeted. Yes. You would think about different policies. So the business side of it is this, understanding is there a disproportionate amount of minority contact or do we police areas where minorities are? You see the difference? Uh And I've learned over the years to be able to become more professional, tone myself up. Unfortunately, you learn this to shut up sometimes. (laughs) Right. I'm just being honest. Sometimes you learn to shut up because the information that you have is not needed at that time. It's, it's things of that nature. All right. Well, I appreciate you uh, sharing that, you know, um, and you're right when it comes to, you know, you always hear people talk about, you know, uh, black on black crime. And we'll get into that in a minute, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, blacks are targeted, especially right now with since the George Floyd you know, incident or even before that, it all, you know, with Trayvon Martin and uh, the Black yes. Lives Matter movement. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, you sharing that brings light to the stuff that's truly happening and what's really going on and sharing how he, it has affected you personally and professionally. Yes. So, well, let me say this. Talk, go ahead. Me, go ahead. Professionally, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because. I don't want to go against what the word says when it says the prophet is not welcome in their own home. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the, the closest to the truth, but the most disappointing because there are so many great people that are in our same areas that we live and grew up in. And you find that we always seek to seek someone else to come in and save us. We always find that someone else to have us in service or a group. And you sit in the group and you answer all the questions and they say, wow, you will be great. And you have so many great coat workers who answered everything you could think of. I had a Stephanie Mills, the superintendent of Glenn Holt, so many people, Dachelle Williams, Jonathan Raymond, we all worked with you study. But here these people never get opportunity to, to, to get in charge and everybody else from everywhere else come tell us how to do it. Now granted, some people were great, but it almost make you think in business, like what about your normal people that are local? We don't have the same education or we don't have the same interest. Like what makes us feel that we're not worthy? So that would be another thing about business. It makes you sometimes wonder and question your own ability. Right. Very true. And, you know, like Mr. Merrick says, we need to get away from protecting one neighborhood and policing the other. Yes. 
test. That's and when he, when, he, when he speak about that, it's, it's almost as we think about what's the difference between across the canal and the garden district? <laughs> what's the difference between the the, 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 the eight ward in, in St. Charles area? What's the, what's the difference between the upper line part of Carrollton in the, in the East? So if there is no difference, then treat it as such. But if there is a difference, then say that is such. So you don't mm -hmm. have people feeling that. Perfect example. It, this would be the greatest time to, re to return schools to neighborhood schools because yes. everybody's at home. That's so if right. you really want to say this effect change, let's return our schools to neighborhood schools. However, people wouldn't return some schools because the schools don't, don't have the educational equity. So if the schools are not on the same level with equality and equity that they get more services to low performing schools, then there's a need to have this diversity. But why should somebody have to drive from one area across town to another area back in town if all the schools were treated the same, with the same amount of fidelity, the same amount of transparency, the same amount of integrity? So mm -hmm. you look at that, and that, and that in itself is something that you find for kids. That's why kids struggle with tone policing again. People will tell us, oh, no, Dr. Jerry, I didn't like how you said it. I didn't like your tone. I didn't like what you were talking about. Tone policing has to do exactly with you worrying about how it sounds versus what they're saying. It's the cop out. It's a way for you to say they're saying the truth. Let me go ahead and get Dr. Jerry off here. Get Dr. Jerry <laughs> off here because, oh, look, well, I didn't like the way it was said, but here we are, very articulate, very well educated. And you ask yourself, why can't the schools return? And someone will tell you that that's a better school. Then we'd say, well, where's the equity in that? If it's a low performance school, they should have more teachers more social worker, more tutors. Instead, they say, well, we want to keep it equal. So see, one half is the same. You want to keep it equal, then but, you say everybody can stay here, but they can't go to another school because it's not equal. So those things have is the byproduct of prison school probably under prison. It's the yeah. byproduct. Why? Because if this kid doesn't feel comfortable in that school that's that far away, if this kid doesn't feel comfortable because of his Demographics. I'm going from the, the, from Velas de Les. I'm going to school at Car. But but if I had a school in between Velas de Les and Car, that made the same strides, that had the same interests, that had the same love, that had the same support, then I could go to one of those schools. But I don't. Right. So you find kids traveling all over. Uh -huh. It's almost like the kids cherry picking to find a school that's gonna make them feel the same. And how can we say that's equal education? It's not. It's not. It's absolutely mm. not. So what do you think? Um, you know, hearing you talk about that um and knowing your profession, what do you think is the root of all that is happening? Okay. Okay, I talked to a good friend of mine, Ronald Cherry. He's in working detention in Houston. And I got brother Roosevelt here. We always talk. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we find is that when there are positions of power and leadership, people begin to fend for themselves. People begin to think that if Dr. Jerry is going to get it, then they ready to make sure Dr. Jerry doesn't get it. If they were going to Dr. Jerry to make sure it don't. So when you have that, we have adult problems. We don't really have yes. problems. Ooh, we have adult freak. problems. And then you is the byproduct of adult problems. For example, we can have a news story. Well, you can have a thousand kids graduate at 35 or how many kids? I'm just giving an example. And that don't get the news clipping. But if you have a shooting in Kenner, they're going to run that news clipping over and over yeah. and over again. But you just saw 35 at a graduation. That was immaculate. And it was beautiful. And it only gets five or ten minutes of the clip. So therefore, we take through, through social media, we tend to push down the throats that the African-American male and females, the people of color, we produce this. We're seeing Kenner over and over again about the shooting. You had 35 graduates from other schools, so we have to promote our own graduations. Imagine Isn't that crazy? people showing it on Facebook. So, But that it be something wrong, and it's national news. Those are the issues that I talk about for adults. Another part of the foundation is education. We don't want to have that deep conversation that say, if I put a kid out over and over again, they feel neglected, they feel rejected. You put them to the same streets that don't work, you don't have any alternative suspension in school. You put them in rooms that's a timeout. You don't have certified teachers to work with them. Are there people who care? How about not a certified teacher, a certified caring person? So just, just take the take the, the credentials away. This is right. a certified throw the, caring throw the whole person. degree away. Put, put a degree in your book sack. 
This is a caring right. person. So when you don't have the people who care, this I have a lady named Nelson. We work together, right? And another lady is Darcel. We call her T D, right? Mm -hmm. But she's from the neighborhood. She's a liaison. They know all the kids. When you have caring people in schools, they don't just put kids out. They just don't run you away. They don't just tell girls you don't smell good. They don't tell a boy because he's twisting his hair, he have dreads, he must be in a gang. Or they don't just judge because he have a hood on. We have so many adults who think, who think they have made it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jerry, I'll tell you one. We have a, 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 a hundred people running for positions coming up. We made a post that said, could you tell a little bit about yourself? You shared it. Could you tell why you're running for office? We haven't had 10 people to respond to why they're running for that position. But then everybody tell you how much they love the kids. And we need to make sure people could take over the community. We didn't have 10 people to respond to a post that was written by kids and community members just so people could know who to vote for. And you hear, vote. Let's practice voting. We got to stand together. We got to vote. The, the people in the community say, we don't even know the people running for office. So, Mr. Crawford, yeah. could you... Could you have them talk about it just so we can know who they are? Yeah. And the crazy yes. part is, that, you know, when it comes to when we talk about voting, you know, I'm glad that you put, did put that out there so we can know, you know, especially in New Orleans, because that's where you are. I mean, there's so much happening in the streets over there. But the thing is, if they don't know and aren't aware of who's running, then yes, how do they know who to vote for? They're just going to do, eight, you know, one, two, three, ABC. They're just going to pick whoever. And then they get mad. You know, when somebody's in that position and they're not doing right by them in the community. And you know what? It's funny. You say about doing right by people. It's just that simple. If you're running for office and, you, and you're a candidate right now in the city of New Orleans we love, just let the people know. Just let the people know a little bit about you because they just don't know. It's not to judge you or scrutinize you. You want them to go to the it's education, right? You want mm -hmm. them to go to the polls with the most knowledge about why they're choosing the candidate or why they're not. But if they have no idea, then that's a part of name recognition. I imagine this, right? If it was a game, then the police would know everything about every one of them. That's right. It's voting, then we don't know the hell, nothing about none of them. But if it was something wrong, they could tell you everything about what school they went to, the last grade they attended, their parents' information, wraparound services. We have people on posters who people would just love to know. I live in St. John Parish. My parents live in New Orleans. I go there daily, and I speak with kids. I speak with family. And I say, who are you going to vote for? And they say, I don't know. Like, who is that? So that's what came up. Oh, you know, that's, that's, that's what it came answer, from. Man. Said, well, I said, well, and know they vote for. Now, this is going to be disturbing, but it's the truth. They vote on how people look. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's crazy. It's the that's truth. Crazy. They vote. Well, this one look good. Or oh, she pretty. Well, I wonder where she stayed. Well, this one came on. So you having kids making a voting decision. And oh, if we're doing this now, can you imagine what happened in November? Who oh, can afford goodness. the most campaigns? Who can afford the most commercials? All those things lead to the impact on juvenile justice and the adult justice system. Wow. The system is broken, man. I mean, even with the voting. And, you know, the only way I look at it is, is lack of knowledge is yes. lack of education and lack of people caring people just don't care hey if it don't affect me i ain't worrying about it why yes. not worry about it you know a kid told me crawford they always have suits with suits and, and some people say what, what do you mean suits with suits simply mean that so many people heavy look and the people they look like dress like the ones they're with he said but if a person wore jeans and just a regular polo shirt, they shouldn't be in the office. And that's why I say, why you say that? He said, because I thought you have to look a certain way because when they have those flyers, that's how they look on the flyers. So it's not about their knowledge. It's not about their contribution. It's not about what they're doing in the community. It's not about their giving back. It's not about their trench work. Some of our young people are voting on how they look and how they dress. And that in itself is labeling because when you go to schools, the first thing they tell you, if you don't have a belt, I may send you home. If you don't right. have your hair, I may send you home. And Dr. Jerry, I am adamant about saying that any Department of Education's policies and procedures with discipline may need to have an overview that's based on, was it an oppression moment? Does it hurt a minority group more than others? And I, and I mean it. Just think about it. If, mm -hmm. if you, in some states we see, if you have a certain hairstyle, you can't graduate. Isn't that crazy? 
But it's there. That's ludicrous, though. Right. But but it's and it's there. So I'm looking for people to say if we're gonna do something right and they care, you don't have to have all these legislative meetings on the ground level of the principal. With the district, we're gonna ban a temporarily ban anything that deals with hair being a distraction in class for now. We don't have to go to, to, to vote for that. Make a decision as a leader saying, because we notice that when our young girls come with red or blue hair, oh, that's not the school style. That's not the, that's not the way the school, that doesn't represent the school, but the last I checked, the school was for the kids. The kids not for the school. Hello? That's right. <laughs> the kids don't run the school. <laughs> so at the end of the day, if a kid has dreads, a young lady has blue hair, red hair, we should be thankful that they want to further the education. But then you see people, I'm going to drop this one in, Dr. Jerry. You ready for this one? I'm ready. We tell our young men they can't have dreadlocks and it's not a good looking. You should watch how you look. But then we watch them on TV from Sports Center and everything else with their hair twisted. We watch them in the church, from, from in the church to the pulpit to the back room where our pastors and preachers had a saying the twisted style. So if it's good <laughs> enough on, for the adults, then what's wrong with the kids? It, it, because it's, it's, it's a reason. Double standard. It, it's a double standard and it's a reason that our kids have to learn how to not be upset. There's a reason if you don't have homework, why don't you have your homework? What's wrong? Your parents not home? You know, there's a reason. Uh, uh, you don't, you don't, you uh, don't, you didn't come to school. What's wrong? Your dad in jail. Even when you have surveys, you have people in your family been shot before. Those things are implicit biases, and people don't want to have this con this conversation because when you have that conversation, we must change things. Yeah, we do. We do. We gotta change it. We have to change it. It hurts. So speaking of change. You know, let's go back to it takes a village. We know that was the same when we were growing up way back in the 80s and, you know, the 90s and all those things. And our parents meant it like literally mm -hmm. it's like, you know what? If I was down the street and that street light came on and you heard that, eh, that means, oh, it's time to go. And if I didn't move, guess what? Mm -hmm. Whoever was on that street, they was like, you better get your tail in the house. They're looking for you. And they're looking for you. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So. So. We have gone so far from that. That don't happen anymore. So do what do you think it's going to take to bring that mentality back, you know, to our communities? And how do we get there? Well, one thing I would say about the village, it's just like a house with sheetrock. You can buy a bad sheetrock or you can buy a good sheetrock. You can have good sheetrock. I'm going to say it again. Or you can have bad sheetrock. But if the foundation is not right, regardless of the sheetrock, Regardless of the electrical work, regardless of the painting, the foundation is not right in the village because people in the village don't identify with being okay unless you have this particular status. If you don't drive this car, you're not good enough for the village. If you don't have this job, you're not good enough for the village. I remember people just sit outside on their porch with family reunions and drink a beer. Now they put the beer in the glass because we keep thinking that white is right. We keep thinking that somebody has to validate us. Us. We think our young kids from the village, and I'm speaking of the village that I come from, right. uh, uh, minority kids and people of color, we keep thinking that white is right. We go into jobs like that. We go into whole food like that. We in the clean is the same. So the village can't teach the kids anything because the village too afraid to be themselves because they haven't been accepted. And those mm -hmm. who are with suits and suits look down on those. So you feel you have to do something different just to be accepted. And your kids are saying, you being fake. That ain't mm -hmm. what you say when you're inside. That ain't what you say when you're on the phone. So kids are watching what we do versus hearing what we say. And the village needs a shake up. The village needs to be gutted out. The village needs to have a meeting. It's time for us to say we are better than that. You know mm -hmm. what Merrick says, step up, become part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We talk all the time. If you're a part of the village, you should be talking every day. But don't talk putting our kids down. Don't talk saying that they're not worthy. Don't talk about the mother because the dad's not there. Don't talk about the dad because he's in jail because you can't spend love after a negative conversation. You, sure? you, you can't get love from that. You didn't right. put the person under the rug, then it went all the way down, then you can say, well, I'm here to help you. Like, you sure? So that's right. the first thing for the village. The second part would be this. We have to find a way to have sustainable homes. We got to find a way to be able to coexist, to co-parent or something. We have too many people out there with our kids trying to figure it out. They don't know the boyfriend from this week or the girlfriend from next week. We have to be better <laughs> with that. We got to be serious about dating because our children are all over the place and they can't figure out what's going on. They're going to be all over the place. We have to do that. Another thing, we have to stop acting like the schools in our city and neighboring parishes are different from each other. 
Yes, I went to St. Augusta, but St. Augustine ain't no different than 35. 35 mm -hmm. not no different than Clark. Clark not no different than Reed. We have to stop acting like classism amongst our children and let's just do a friendly competition because if one thing you've learned through katrina it didn't make a difference it didn't make a difference it didn't make a difference where the, the you water, the water took out everybody one thing you learn from that so that's the second thing with village third thing with village is this respecting our elders and paying homage Ooh we we got to respect now. our elders we got to say yeah there was a mama d yeah there was a duck but there was a sandra hester too we got to talk about everybody don't just pick the ones that align to what we believe in and then once we hear that we cut it off. Like once we hit a part we like, we don't want to hear no more. And once we hit a part we don't like, we don't want to hear anymore. We mm -hmm. got to get to the point that we understand that that's a necessary need to have females of color in leadership in our school. Point Come on now. blank, period. Hello. I don't have to have a reason why. It don't have to do with George Floyd. It don't have to do with Trevor Tri Martin. Why don't you tell me what well, all the schools we have, we don't have them in our leadership, period, because they're there. And then we got to understand how to support each other. How do we support each other with fidelity to say that if Dr. Jerry needs something, I'm going to answer. But, I, but just because she does something for me, I don't have to get something from Dr. Jerry. See, we want to have an even exchange. Right. When you told me you never knew one day that I, I considered you to be my mentor. You had no clue until I told you. I said, I've been watching you. I like how professional you are. And I said, I would like for you to mentor me. See, that's when a person has humility to say, I want to be better. I want to know more but at the same token if you have another person that's your co-worker or that's your friend don't want to see dr jerry win don't want to see Ms. nelson win don't want to see ronald cherry have something then kids see that and kids mm -hmm. are street smart kids say you know what my daddy cool but he fake i'm like why oh, he yeah. fake because he take care of somebody else's family more than he take care of us Ooh, so he can't even come at me with all that right there. that's the kid <laughs> they, the they, they tell you i said well why are you out there in the streets he said, man, every time you look, my mama telling me about how much the bill's going to be. My mama saying how much the bill's going to be. My dad act like he don't care. So I went and hit a lick, a hustle, so I could help with the bills just so she could shut up. Mm. You heard that, right? He said, all that nagging in my ear. So I'm going to go do something. Oh, I'm going to go smoke. I'm going to pop some pills. I'm going to chill because I can't take the stress of being a 12-year-old. I can't take the stress of being a kid because my mom is struggling. But then I see them on TV talking about they living their best life. Then I see them at the second line. They dress with all their Gucci on, and I don't have nothing for school. So the truth of it is, the kids saying, "You doing you, and I'm gonna do me." I'm gonna do me. Ain't, and guess what? Sad. And it was crazy, Dr. Jerry. Everybody doing themselves, and this is what we get. This is the results of everybody's doing them. You remember right. you asked somebody, "Hey, you got something going on?" And he'd be like, "You gonna come visit? Yeah, I'll come visit." Now they want to know what's in it for them before they even do what you ask them. It's crazy. They, <laughs> they always want to see something back in return. Whatever happened to Karen? Because you want to do it. Yes. You know, I want to be an influence. I want to yep. make sure that these kids are doing right. And like you said, yeah, they these kids watch what we as adults do. You know, and I know specifically for my daughter, she pay attention to everything. And yes. if she, you know, her brain cells sometimes is better. Mom getting a little old, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but she'll recall some stuff that happened years ago and be like, Mama, you remember this? You remember when you said this? You know, and mm -hmm. I'd be like, Wow, they pay attention to what we do. Yes, you know, and they, and they, and they learn remember. either I'm not gonna be like that or I'm gonna be just like that, or it's okay since my mama act like that, I'm gonna act like that too. You know, and what you're talking about is parenting. You know, you're saying that kids actually look at it through this sense. This is their lens. I'm going to be better than my parents, or I won't be like my parents at all, or I'm going to just do my own thing. Back when we were growing up, we followed the role model I want to be like and then add my own twist on it. You have That's kids right. now say, I don't want to be nothing like them. Imagine a child saying, I don't want to be nothing like my dad. I don't want to be nothing like my mom. And, and, you know, it hurts the soul. But that in itself tells you what does parenting look like, for an example. Certain things you're doing on the phone. What's up, Franklin? Certain things you're doing on the phone in front of your children. Say we out of line. That's why they're trapped in streets, buried alive. We are putting the dirt on our children. If you're smoking yeah. marijuana with your children, you, you might as well go out there and get the shovel, go in the backyard, and I said it's Dig that hole it. so hole digging that hole for them. If you, got, if, you got, if you got your son with his girlfriend in the room and they, they spend the night, they can have company and having sex, go get the shovel. 
Go to your backyard, start digging that hole. If you don't care if your kid go to school or not, and I'm not saying you don't care about your kid, you don't care if they go to school or not because you're going through, I'm going to need you to go get that shovel because two things are going to happen. The streets going to eat them up if the Lord don't get to them first and save them, or the prison system going to take them in. You know, Mary said, to be a man, you got to see a man. And a man has to do that. Dr. Jerry, we all are responsible, some of my friends, for dating different women and just out here doing stuff that was not right. It is what it is. And we apologize and we work through repentance. That's why we give to our community. And we have women who feel the same way. But we don't judge that. We don't hold it over your head. If Merrick called me, I'm coming. If Roy Handy called me, I'm coming. Byron Goodwin is a good friend of mine, principal, I'm coming. It's like we call on those who do the work, but now the village calls on those who look like. And another thing I'm going to tell you, I, I got to get this off because I'm glad you called me. I'm excited to be on there with you. Go ahead. Go ahead. We have to stop destroying each other on live, talking about our brothers and sisters. Oh, my period. God. We have to take a stance on if I don't like something, I'm going to have to contact you. Um, matter of fact, me not liking something and talking about it what I don't like about you on live only shows that I'm not ready for what it is. If I am if I don't like something that someone's doing, I need to keep that to myself because I have to give them the power to affect me to want to talk about it on, on social media. Now, if it's about a position, let me break this down for some people. To talk about a person's position and them able to do their job and their ability to do their job or not is different. But our kids, the Nelson, say, yes, our kids are watching. Yes, we have to hug more, but not now, now with COVID. <laughs> Make sure we clear. No, I'm talking about right here. That's why I bought insurance for when I'm talking. No hug, don't you hug nobody. But imagine what love looked like. I'm gonna show you what love like, Dr. Jerry. The yes. bus pull up, staff out there smiling, kids getting off the bus running. That's at my school, Garyville Middle School, Principal Corey Lambert. We in St. John Parish. My, my sister, Principal Candace Murphy, all my co-workers. Kids come out running to get to school. They go in the cafeteria, it's love. It's not throw your food away. It's not do this and that. People say, well, what's wrong with that? Because so many people report to work angry. So many people report to work like they just don't want to be at work at all. And kids can sense rejection just like a puppy. Yes. You don't have to say much. The kids say, I don't know what's wrong with them today. They're tripping. And then we begin tone policing when the kids say, oh, you're tripping. Who you think you're talking to? But then they see you by the break room, you're talking reckless. They see the police coming, they're talking reckless. It's just a whole system of recklessness. And how do we do it? It's by taking a time out. Get off the show with Dr. Jared. Go in the mirror and say, I got to do better. Go in the mirror and say, what will I do today that's going to be for the beneficiaries of the future, our children? What have I done that I need to work on? I realized myself, I'm not a good team player. I had to, I had to accept it. I, I'm not a good team player because I always judge my team members. And mm -hmm. I struggle with Dr. Jeremy. Have you, you can counsel me right now. Put me in counseling. I struggle with working <laughs> I with people. You. I struggle with working with people, giving them a second and third chance. When I think I, I mean, honestly, I judge them on how they judge other people. They want me to judge them on how they judge me. I can't do nothing for you. I, I, I ain't nothing I can do for you. So you treat me good as nothing. I'm watching how you treat the people who don't have, and people want to use that as if. Oh, wait a minute. So what are you saying? I'm saying this, we tend to treat people good on how they treat us, but how they treat the people that do not have should be our, our measuring rod. How do you treat those kids who don't have fathers and parents? How do you treat those kids who have not come? How do you treat those kids who don't have a book set? How do you treat those kids from the local communities? Right. But then I watch them. When you have another person from another race coming to school for a PD, you all, how you doing? You, you speaking to everybody, you treating everybody with the utmost respect. And then you tell me about tone, the whole tone and their voice change. You change your tone, it's you change your posture. Yes, and then the kids be like, you know what kids say? They say, look at them acting white. Yeah. There's some power in what they're saying because they believe that that's the measure of Ross for being correct. Or Mr. Crawford, you gotta talk white because we have visitors. That's kids telling you that. What do you mean? Talk, what's talking white? We have labeled things that seem to be correct as being white things. Mm hmm. And, and that's that's why it's important. I mean, my biggest thing I struggle with, I'm not signing off on that thing. I'm not signing off on that I hate all police. 
I'm not signing off on that. Come on now. I, I, you know, I'm not, go listen, <laughs> Come on. I'm not signing off on that. Morel Murray, Beach Rod, uh, Sean Ferguson, Tanisha Stevens, Michelle Wolfuck, my aunt Betty Luce. I'm not signing off on that. Cops care too, because behind the bed inside the uniform is an everyday friend. I'm not signing off on that. You know, all these people talking about oh, police don't care, that whatever, they all bad. When you teach that, that's hate. And your children are watching that. You can try to make it look good. I don't, you should not be in nobody church, nobody pulpit, teaching that same thing as well. You're teaching hate, and we try to give our life to the Lord. You got people confused. I'm not signing off on it. I'm not. They can get upset with me. They can block me because I'm not going to tell a kid if they bring in my house. I never call my what I'm gonna call my friends. <laughs> they bring in your house. What are you gonna do? Well, let me go call my neighbor. The first person you call when something wrong is the police. Now we got to work on it. Merrick said humanizing the badge. We got to work on those things like yourself. I tell you, I admire you. Talk about the domestic violence because you're serious. But if we serious about getting the company together, getting the company. What I mean by the company is the people that you have with you. If I see something that's not right, it shouldn't matter if it's a Walmart uniform, a deputy sheriff, a pop <coughs> guy. Not right is not right because of what it is. Not because of what you wear and not because of what I think. Not because of those conditions. Because you, you, you have to teach that to kids. We are yeah. teaching kids. My school have mixed kids. So we got mixed kids in our school. I can't go to school talking about well, what y'all think about the white people because Adults are coercing those conversations so they can have their own platform when you was never in the village anyway. You were never there helping. You just out there running for office and all of a sudden, let's say I'm not signing up. All of a sudden, you're talking about, well, I'm here to take care of kids. Well, go on your Facebook page three years ago. Where were you? Oh, go on your Facebook page five years ago. You're real Where good about you? the yeah. you, mm -hmm. Listen, and that shouldn't delete your page. Show me what you did in the community when you was off the clock. I'm not talking about when you were at work. Show me what you did when there was a person and you went in your closet and you got all your shoes and bags and you brought it to the homeless shelter or the women's shelter. When was the last time you showed some humanity for those who didn't have? But let us have a party. And we're going to go back and put the red bottles, Ooh. the best of the best. In the best of the best. Set. And breaking the bank while they doing it. And you say, what they say, uh, well, I don't know where the children get that from. They got their priorities messed up. No, they ain't got they their priorities messed do. up. They watching the village. The village have priorities like that. And, and, and those things is what are the byproducts. That's the byproducts, Dr. Jerry, of a disproportionate amount of another contact. We got people in jail in the right grade that can't read. How that work? Huh. Come on right now. grade, can't read. So if you're in the 12th grade, you can't read, and it's been since after 05, it's a part of the charter system. So the truth of it is somebody somewhere along the line wasn't overseeing what was taking place and you no, made it all yeah. the way to Hunts. You didn't made it all the way to Angola. You didn't made it all the way to Dixon. Or you sitting in Canazero's office about to sign a plea bargain, and you still couldn't yeah. read, but you had your class ring on. Somebody got to talk about Come that. Come on, now. somebody for real. Come you on, got the class ring on. You didn't graduate the diploma, but you got to do a plea bargain. And you ask somebody because they really ask what that means. I'm not saying it because it's a conversation that we have to be wrong about. We got to be able to talk about these things in a healthy environment, in a caring environment, in a loving environment. I I, I have to say. For my principals and my, my, my administrators in the school districts, I know it's a challenge coming up for our schools. But you ever just thought that if you ask the parents, you ever thought if you ask those who you're serving, what do they think of some of the solutions? You go rock your brain all day trying to figure it out by yourself. Why don't you ask the parents, ask the kids, ask the custodians, ask the janitors, ask the people at Dollar General. Just ask and somebody may just have an answer that can save the whole world. That is what I stand on. I stand on it. And I say this in front of anybody. The people say, well, you're rocking with the police. I ain't rocking with you. Well, I'm, I'm trying to get to heaven. I don't know what they're talking about. Come on. But the last I check, God, the, the God I serve, they're not going to be out there with a magic detector or taping your temperature. I'm trying to get in heaven and pay for everything I want. So, That's right. gonna stop me. so I'm going to love on people. I empower people to say, how would you feel when somebody say you stole something and you're a part of the group? The first thing we'll be like, I ain't still nothing. I ain't a part of the group. How'd you feel if somebody say you wrecked the car, you wasn't driving? The, the first thing you would do is begin to defend your character. character. And why would we defend the characters of good officers? But then we tell our kids character counts. Well, let's talk about integrity. We have a whole bunch of lip service. I'm not signing off on it. I had a co-worker, Ms. Bevins. She said, she always said, <laughs> my little girl, she said, I'm with you when you're right. 
I love when she said that. She said, I'm with you when you're right. That speaks volumes. Yes, it does. It, it's not about your color. It's not about your job. It's not about your title. She said, Crawford Bear, I'm with you when you're right. If we could just take that mantra, I'm with you when you're right. Let's go, my friend April. We have deep conversation. And what I like about April as well, you push the envelope. Yeah, that's my sister too. I know that's what so you saw us come out to cover the Kill Air Parade. Yeah. We came to Kill Parade because we believe in the sisterhood that you all bring and the quality right. that you have through love. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, like April mentioned, you know, it's not the education system. The education is supposed to help aid, right? Mm -hmm. And teach. But again, it starts at home. Now, so this leads into my next question. What if it ain't happening at home? So how do we get to the youth and love on them and show them that we care because you have some that's at home but they just they desire to have these positive role models they desire to want to go after their dreams they desire to have that person in their life to love and care for them okay so and that's a great question i would start with a few things one that i know that i don't take it personal if they cuss me they mad they run it i don't take it personal i remind them all the time look when you when you finish, holler at me. I know you're going to <laughs> because I need them to understand in life we're gonna to be there for each other. I That's tell right. kids all the time when they're in jail, they didn't, they won't throw urine, they won't get upset, they won't do all this stuff. They had a gang fight. I didn't have kids having a gang fight, and I walk out down the yard and they'll start fighting. I'm not don't handcuff them, just let me talk to them. And mm -hmm. I'm in charge. Why? Because I need to let them understand I don't have to restrain you and detain you to talk to you. To talk to you. I don't That's I'm not. I don't want to make you unruly because I know you have it in you. You just having something that you're going through. So for kids who are home by themselves, we need to understand what lucky kids mean. We got to talk about trauma. We got to talk about PTSD. We got to talk Hello. about if the kids have a reoccurring things. If people are hollering at home all day or neglect at home and I get to school and then nobody's talking to me, they won't feed me. Come on now. You got to have people like see Ronald Scott, Brothers at Peace, is taking kids. He, ain't, he don't have all the funding. You got all the love. See, if you don't have it at home, those community-based programs. Money. It don't take money to love on kids. That's hey, come free. On. Come on. God gives us that. It's John, free. You know, it's a guy, my, uh, my, my good friend, John, right? John Maximilian. We would take 37 kids every summer to Memphis, Arkansas, playing AU basketball. We had three teams, starting with kids, eight olds all over the 17. And we asked the kids' parents to donate $20 a, a trip. That was it. Why? Because we didn't need to make money off your kids because they played for the team. We had jobs. We had people that were sponsored. See, a lot of times kids can't get the love in different groups because those groups use some of the money that the parents are giving to keep the group working. But imagine if it was minimal fee. These people are out in the community. They got the village peoples. They got different organizations. They got the Erase the Board. They got all these organizations that are grassroots organizations with their own mission. We should be willing to listen because something they say may save our kids who don't have parents. We should be willing to listen and understand when a kid go to court. Yeah. And the informal fans, informal fans, and things of that nature is seeking help outside our first security today. A lot of times we have one issue. Dr. Jared, the first thing, if we could listen without trying to give an answer. Hello. If we could just hear children out without trying to give an answer, without turning to the social worker, without turning to the thesis, without turning to the dissertation, just hear them out and see what they're saying. They really have a lot of information about themselves. We're trying to triage the kid and the kid right there, we can ask them. And then we ask them in front of other people and humiliate them. And then you see them in the hallway, now they don't trust you. You just put that whole thing together. Right. All you, you talk, have to kid, talk, talk to talk, them. Talk to them. Listen to them. When you had that story about your daughter, I was like, my God. And I shared it with some of my coworkers. And people say, well, Leroy, you know, what do you think about that? What do you think about juvenile crime and the kids carrying guns? I know a few things that I could put my hand on. A lot of those kids are searching to belong. And in the search to belong for things we learned at St. Augustine, you want to feel safe, effective, love, and belong. If you don't feel safe, anything can happen. You don't feel effective, that's the part what you do, anything can happen. You don't feel like you belong, you join anything. And if there's no love, anything can happen. I learned mm -hmm. that through the halls of 2600, that even if you didn't have money, you had your brothers, so you have love. And you should be able to call on your brothers at any time. 
And that is what a village looked like. I learned that at St. Augustine. Right. I don't care. I'm 50. I could call kids from 1984 and we on the same page. Same right? page. Because we teach that. That's why we have our local fraternities and our local sororities and our civic organizations and our pastors and preachers teaching love. But you can't teach love out of one side of your mouth and then on the other side of your mouth, you're saying the N-word and you're degrading your own people. You're sending mixed messages for those who are sponges of everything. They are sponges. They want to know, how do I have it? If you don't like the dad, keep that to yourself. If you don't like the mom, keep that to yourself. <laughs> yeah. But don't be so disrespectful that your daughter hiding that you got a friend or that your son hiding that you got a friend. You're out of line. And that's what yeah. we see. So when kids don't have family, then they go sleep by other people's kids. And only God knows what's going on in their house because the kids are good at keeping secrets. I know I did. Kids are really good at keeping secrets. How do we move forward, Dr. Jared? We got to be deliberate about our conversation. We got to be cautious with our words. We have to be important about what we say. And we got to say, I can't say something and send a subliminal message because I know that this young sister, this young brother is watching. I need to open that door for my sister. I need to be a better gentleman so they can know what the gentleman look like and explain to them why I did it. I just can't open the door and walk off because it gives no explanation. They like, why are you open the door? I said, because that's how a gentleman carry yourself. So if you want to be a gentleman, check it off, open the door and pass it on. Tell a young lady so you don't have to be loud, and this is nothing I don't I don't care for. You. Stop yeah, telling you they're loud in common. They're yeah. loud in common. That's degrading. That's oxymoron. Oh, you loud in common. You're degrading people. You don't stop degrading our young girls. Stop degrading. And if they choose, if they choose to be a part of LGBTQI and transgender, and you have a Not problem with calling them the name. And you have a problem with calling the name that they identify with, you should not be in the positions of authority. If they choose to identify with something else, who are you to get so upset that you would not allow them to be able to call a name that they didn't? You want to give your personal impression on LGBTQTI. You want to give your personal impression on transgender. So now kids feeling that, hey, my friend may be this, or my cousin might be this, or my parents may be this, and now you my instructor, or you my counselor, and I hear you judging them, we are out of line, and I'm not for that. If that's how they identify themselves, then that's on them. You're not God. You're not Jesus. We ain't asked you to go do no assessment on nobody, child. What you do the first thing? Just go love them up. Love them up as is, as is enough. But you, you uncomfortable. You watch this. You getting paid and you're uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable in your skin because you don't want to sit in the PD and learn how it works. It's, it's, it's those things. Mm. Um, you got me on fire, Dr. Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> got me on fire right now. But you are dropping some. I mean, again, like I was telling people before we had this conversation, you were gonna come with it because you are passionate about what you do. I mean. For these youth in the streets you know what i mean just like i'm passionate about advocating for people when they're done wrong or That's when right. they're victims of domestic violence victims yes. of sexual assault youth who have been bullied you know yes. what i'm saying I, I care i have a passion and i care you know what i mean yes. Ooh, I, I, that's why i follow you because it's there <laughs> on topic you know my my good my pot my, my my i call him my partner but he my pastor pastor michael matthew i see brother kenny cut no listen we run it for real until you had yourself stripped of your power, when somebody's in jail, and I've seen kids where you give them the toilet paper, you give them the amount of toilet paper they're going to use. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You don't think that's demeaning? Or you wash all the underwear together. Let me just talk to you. For some of my parents saying, I don't care what they can do. They can get out of my house. I'm going to send them to jail. Imagine you go to a place where it's 20 or 30 something kids, uh, 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 and they put all your underwear in one bag. Mm. And wash them all together and then come back and, and dump it on the table and everybody grab one. Mm. Is, is that what we trying to survive with? Imagine you go to eat and somebody who looks just like you, a young African-American male who thinks just like you, Jerry, a female, taking your food. Is that what we're preparing them for? Imagine you have a kid have an incident in New Orleans and they put in a facility in Shreveport and they already have having family struggling. Imagine mm. those variables and then you say what they're gonna be when they grow up how because everything around them is designed for them to feel but then when people talk about systematic failure everybody have a problem with it you you, you shouldn't have a problem with the truth and i guess god got to tell us we was wrong the truth set you free the truth actually have more people getting incarcerated than anything else because they mm -hmm. spoke up for what it was 
Mm-hmm. How many times you have kids say, I didn't have a weapon? How many times we have the innocence project that was based on wrongful convictions? Yeah. What did that tell you? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we have a lot to work on, but I know that's some solutions. I'm solution yeah. focused. Same as, and you know, I am too. Yeah, I you know, know and, 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 and you know, it takes people like April and Letizia and Merrill and right. Sandy, you know, you know, and, and, and the crazy part is, this is where we have to end. You know, I'm calling, I'm probably I'm swinging in a different direction, and I know okay. we running down on time, but you know, we also, you know, they we still have to stop giving, you know, the, you know, these people that narrative, you know, to to look down on us or to say, you know, that there's black on black crime, you know, and then the thing about it is not all white people, you know. I keep t- I get so tired of hearing people say, oh, you know, the white people doing this to the white people. Like, man, how when are we gonna move from the past? Like, let's let's not let's all white people ain't bad, all Hispanics ain't bad, all Filipinos ain't bad, but love on the ones that want to actually do the work with you and show them, hey, guess what? We can do this together, we can do this in unity. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that because I've had opportunity to work with Merrill Merrick. You hear me talk about Pat all day, right? Mm-hmm. And my friend John, we always have these conversations. We started a program, it's called SAFE, and it stands for Sensitivity Allows for Empowerment. We have a page it's called SAFE. And what we're trying to do is we're deciding that even Mark Barnes from Dillard, we, sp- we spoke with him today, is a good colleague of our and classmate. We want to find a procedure, a, a, a philosophical uh formula in the formula for us is, is safe sensitivity allows for empowerment that we teach that no matter what it is whether it be police brutality whether it be neglect whether it be workplace violence if we could just use that safe method to to kind of work things out to hear things we want to have these colorblind conversations so we're going to be looking for some people to be a part of some focus groups so we can move forward because all is not everybody right. you know it's a classification well, all this is bad. All that is bad. We How have great know? things going on. We have great things going on. Even if people don't agree with charter schools or public schools, we still have to have the ability and the knowledge. Man, my friend, Antrees talk about it. To just say when it's right, give people their props. If you don't like it, that's on you because it's something you got to work with internally. But you can't tell me everything wrong with everybody about everything. Mm-hmm. And if that's all you showcase and that's all you sell, then why would somebody follow you if everything come out your mouth is negative? You have to pace yourself as an adult and say, how do we move forward? And what I plug in right now is the safe model. Merrill Merrick, my friend Keisha Carter, but Pat, he's an NOPD and it was personal. Our good friend was killed, an uh, act of violence, Daryl Holloway. He was our classmate from St. Augustine. He was our friend. He was my pork chop partner. We eat our pork <laughs> chops by the house. He was our friend, Kenny Duke Rose. We all were best friends for years. And that started at 2600. And in, in, in that also, I got to shout out my, my, my other friend. See Kim DeLoso? You know Kim DeLoso? Yeah, I know her. I remember she had you at the Nays and Fine. All of those people that are giving up their personal time to do positive things. Things in the community. You're we right. have to we, we have to have our own network. Oliver Thomas. I'm proud of Gerard Seas, my friend Lamont. I can name all of them. But if you are a person that think policing kids is going to be the answer, I'm going to have to tell you, Angola have a lot of free bays with or without the COVID. Hunts have a lot of free bays. San Gabriel have a lot of free bays. And education and jail don't go together. It it, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. But you got Dr. Jerry, you are the rapper. What's and name? I say I have um Yolanda King. She says you're on point, but you're facing an uphill battle. But keep pushing. And you know that's true. And at the end of the day, guess what? We're going to keep pushing. Because I know one thing about me. As long as I have a breath in my body and God mm-hmm. keeps opening my eyes every day, I'm going to keep pushing because these kids are lost and it takes people like us. And if we get out there and we can get around the right people, I mean, mm-hmm. back in the day, we used to be at people's houses just having these conversations. Let's yes. start having these conversations at home. You know what I'm saying? We ain't got to mm-hmm. sit here and have these conversations over the phone, you know, because people can be bumping their gums over the right. phone. But you get the real when you see them face to face. I know COVID is going on right now, yeah. but guess what? You can still see their face on Zoom. You yeah. can see their face on go-to meeting. You can see if they really care when they're talking and speaking. So there is no excuse that we can't come together as a people to try to make sure that we are saving our kids out here in the streets. Yes, yes. And Yolanda, thank you for that. And guess what? We are already talking to the people that do it because at my school, the St. John Parish School District, we working. 
You know, I've learned that they say you can do two things. You can follow those who not or those who will. Those who will are already on board. Those who won't, they got time to do what they want to do. Like my, like my, my friend Pastor Mike said, miss me with all that. That's his it, it makes sense. I don't have enough time to do both. So I need to focus on those who are willing to save those kids. Because at the end of it all, all I want to hear God say is well done. Well that, done. That's, I've had that's, a situation. that's all I want to hear too. <laughs> We've all had situations when we ain't had enough money, and maybe God paying us back for the kids we serve. Maybe God is blessing us in overflow for the children we work with. So that being said, the right people. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll type a verse up in a minute. I do know yeah. Proverbs nineteen seventeen. If you take care of the poor and long your service to the Lord, He will bless you. Basically, mm -hmm. if we just take care of those kids or those in need. We're gonna be all right. Yeah, and and, and, and that's just how I feel. Yeah, April said, I think we're missing a critical point that parents need to be addressed. We spoke about that April earlier when we were talking about, yeah, you need to have this conversation with the parents. You need to put, hey, start getting like you was back in the day. Be like, here, come here, let me holler at you. You know what I'm saying? Let, right. Let's talk about your children. You know, let's talk about your kids because at the end of the day, if we don't care to talk to the parents, then they're not going to care about their kids, period. The conversation so let, needs to happen. Let me plug in right there. Let me plug in right there, right? That's a sensitive part for me. <laughs> If the parents don't get out, if we don't listen, you got to take the parents out of the equation. That's if they don't listen, right? Because guess what? A lot of parents are still struggling with themselves to feel like they can sit at the table with the elite adults. Yeah. So a lot of times they feel embarrassed about where they live. They feel embarrassed about what they wear because they hear so frequently what people are saying. And what April's saying is we got to include the parents in these discussions and not tune them out because they're not available. What if you do yeah. have a parent? That doesn't understand what we're talking about. A parent who's not on board. That shouldn't stop care. us from. That shouldn't stop us from doing what we doing. I, I worked in the jail for over twelve years. I ain't saw a parent yet inside the jail cells, and they come home talking about how much they love me. Crawford, you did everything. Kid just came home from during twelve years. Say you've been there. So I can't just say that, you know. So I, I, what I see the parent or not, the, the parent didn't get off the school bus. The kid did. Mm -hmm. The parent ain't come through lockup. The kid did. And right. I'm going to be a parent that's good enough to include the parent. But what I find sometimes at the jury, some parents have so much going on. I, I, I didn't think it was like that. But you know from people that you work with, some of my parents are overwhelmed. And those kids don't make it no easier. So they're putting a little spice on top of overwhelm. Yeah, so that's true. that doesn't give them an out. But if it was a medical term, it would be considered an underlying condition. If it was yeah. COVID, it would be an underlying condition. Right. So I and, you say, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree with you. Some parents are overwhelmed. And I'm going to tell you just right now, I don't want to mm -hmm. go over too much time, but, you know, I'm a mentor for foster kids, okay, right? Wow. I have two of them, you know, and even these kids that's in the foster system, they still have parents that don't care. Foster parents don't care. They're worrying about collecting a check, check, you know, or, you know, they, they, they like you say, PTSD, they got trauma, be, abandonment, all these other issues. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, because we have this program that's been implemented in Mississippi, you know, through our church, we partner okay. you know, with OC, OCJ Kids, we can be mentors with CPS, you know, wow. going through the in our background checks and still be able to be mentors to these kids and positively influence them, even though it's absent in a home. Does that make yeah. sense? Oh, it makes it makes perfect sense. I, I, I applaud you because what you're telling me is that I only can focus on what's in front of me. And I can do the best, and I hope that I can empower a kid enough to know how to cope with their home. But one thing about children, you turn, you say the wrong thing about their parents or get a wrong impression, they'll cut you off. Now, they can talk about them themselves. <laughs> but if you make the wrong impression that you make them feel their parents are not worthy, it just shuts the kids down. And I love how y'all get the partner. You get the clearance through DCFS. Man, that's that, that, that's it awesome. Them. It takes yes. the burden off them. And the thing, good thing I like about this program is, you know, when they age out at 18, mm -hmm. you know, they basically the foster parents can be done with them. But we are stuck with them till they turn 24 years old. Wow, so that's great. We, we continue that journey with them to make sure they do the things they want to do. Go to college or go to the military, you know, learn how all these things that they need to learn to make sure they have the tools necessary to be able to face all the stuff that they're going, you know, face in the world. Yes. So that's one thing I like about that program, you know, and mm -hmm. again, my heart is always with the youth. My daughter going to college, I got number time. <laughs> right, right. And, you so, know, we're looking for some people, Merrick's and myself, we're going to do some small focus groups with the Safe Initiative. We have people in the forest, Boston, Minnesota, Delaware, they're all on a part of it because 
we have to hear different perspectives and we have to listen without without judgment it you know implicit bias is something that i've done some shows on and really a lot of times we just really don't realize we saying things that hurt people we right. just really don't realize that because we think that is normal mm-hmm. and you think that is normal even and, and the last thing i would tell you is this somebody say well kids talk about well we try to talk white and say so you ever notice when you go to certain restaurants of different ethnicities they never change how they talk mm-hmm. and i was like yeah why and it made me realize then why are we changing what we sound like? Yeah, it hit home. I was like, it really hit home. We got to be proud of this who we are, and looking to increase and become better. But increasing and come, becoming better doesn't mean changing who you are. It is it, it, upgrading what you do. All right, I agree. Well, I want to say thank you for dropping all of those nuggets. I, Ooh, I, I had a great time. <laughs> I know, right? You done hit everybody with something. You hit me with something. And so, and I, again, thank you for even telling me, like I said, it shocked me when you said I was one of your mentors undercover. Sure. You know, I, you, again, I just never know who's watching me. And you asked me to mentor you even further. I, I, hey, I'm honored. And I have no problem with sharing what I know so that right. way we can do things together in these streets. Um, so before we end, I have two more questions for you and mm-hmm. then we'll go ahead and um, uh, get off of here. But do you have any so do you, with all the work that you do do you have any upcoming events that's coming up or any projects or initiatives that's happening that maybe you know myself or anybody that wants to be you know come on board and be involved in with you yes safe sensitivity allows for empowerment M- myself and Meryl Merrick's are co piloting the program that's teaching people how to build relationships how to deal with harming relationships and how to work together. We wanted this creative philosophy that this is no need to talk less and listen more. Uh, I'll be going to Chicago coming up to do a, uh, what is it? I'm a, the keynote speaker at a school in Chicago for the upcoming school year, as well as visiting five schools in Chicago that deal with violence. Uh, I'm working with Arkansas Department of Youth Services. Uh, I'm working right now with Job Corps. I'm working with the program that's in uh, Florida that deal with the mental health services. Woo! That's just some of the small things. <laughs> national Partnership Juvenile Service, and National uh, for Crime Victims. I want to be involved because if I had anything at the end, I would want to make sure we could decrease the amount of kids that are involved in juvenile justice systems. I do my lives. I have my, my co director, Michonne. She always used to tell me, you know, for a year straight, I did live every morning for about five, six in the morning. Mm-hmm. For a year straight. And people say, why you did that? Because I wanted to repent to the law for things that I should have done better. Yeah, and I knew I had to give up to give in, and once That's I right. gave up, give in, my overflow came. So for whoever's out there, and you're going through a little something, my friend Keisha Carter, my friend Rody, all my prayer warriors, I want you to know you got to stay in the game, baby. Stay in the game, no matter what it look like. Stay around positive people. Keep your prayer circle together. On my refrigerator, it says on April 6th, dear Lord, I want to be. The, watch this what it says. I want to be the most inspirational speaker international now. Dear Lord, I want to have a financial overflow and blessing now. Please reunite my family. Keep from home. Your son, Leroy Crow. My, my, my friend, Keisha hey, Carter, she's a prayer warrior. She said, you got to say it. You got to write it. it you got to speak it. And guess what? Mm-hmm. I've been saying it, speaking it, and writing it. You <laughs> know, I ain't got scared. Manifestation. <laughs> Look, that manifestation got me nervous. I'm like, man, Lord, you mean to tell me? But I learned something, Dr. Jared. You got to get right. That's right. You got. You got to do right your best. Bad, that 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 Pastor Oren said three things. He said, "When you're trying to do your best, you got to expect it, detect it, and reject it. That's all yeah. things got to take you off the courts." That's so right. that's what's coming up. The safe program. Awesome. Um, you you can give us that. Yes, I. Well, I'm, I'm gonna have you. No, know, that's all for me. So I drive that hour in thirty right. minutes. You yes, can, and listen. You know, I drive down there. Any opportunity you have where we can come to you, we're gonna do it. Look at Cheryl, Rashid. Man, I have so many oh, loving friends. I'm going Man, I'm all, of them. all them good people. That's just good people. Yeah. That's good people committed. That's it. We need right. people like that, that care. Yes. yes. So, before we end our conversation and our interview, um, what is one thing that you would like to share with those who have been watching us? Um, and the, that you want to leave on their hearts, you know, tonight before we get off. Look into the eyes of those kids. And if you see yourself in them, don't leave because somebody left you. 
Look into the eyes of those kids, not even your kid, and you can see a glimpse of something you've been through. Don't leave them because somebody left you. Stay the course. All right. What a powerful word. Well, thank you, Mr. Leroy Crawford. I appreciate you being my right. guest. Again, I'm honored to be your mentor. Well, I'm excited. Those of you are watching, if you just jumped on, please share this broadcast. Somebody needs to hear this good conversation right. that happened today. Um, and you can follow Mr. Leroy Crawford on Facebook and Instagram at I am Leroy C. Yes. Again, we talked about trapped in the streets, buried alive, saving our kids, live with empowerment advocate. Thank y'all so much. I love y'all and have a blessed one. 2600 St. Augustine, baby. Salute. <laughs> all right. Oh, oh wait, let me go claim my oh. Oliver Perry Walker on that West Bank. Oh, all right. The West Bank, the best bank. <laughs> all right. All right. All thank right. You, Doc. Good night, all right. y'all. Good night.